it's just a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Sonda Moldovan all the way from Beverly Hills, California. For almost a decade, she has lectured at the UCLA School of Dentistry, teaching other dentists how to perform optimum implant surgery. In 2006, she became interested in helping her patients heal better through natural techniques such as diets, supplements, water, and bioenergetic devices. Dr. Sonda received her nutritional certification through the Certification Board of Nutritional Specialists three years ago as a certified nutritionist and periodontist. Dr. Sonda educates her patients that the mouth is a gateway to their health, Her new book, Heal Up, comes out in July. She practices in both Beverly Hills and Manhattan, New York, using minimally invasive oral surgery techniques and integrative nutrition. She is a frequent contributor to national television shows such as The Doctor on CBS, NBC News, radio, podcasts, and she is quoted in numerous publications and blogs. She is a contributor to the Huffington Post and Inside Dentistry and hopefully someday Dentaltown Magazine. How are you doing? I'm great, Dr. Howard. How are you? I'm doing really good. And um, I I think it's so neat that you're combining nutrition and periodontal disease because, you know, when I got out of school 30 years ago, all the older redneck dentists thought anything to do with holistic or nutrition or anything natural that you were just a whack. But then when you watch those dentists, they're all like that. They, when a dentist gets high blood pressure, he doesn't want to take a blue pill every day. He wants to lose weight and start exercising. So when you look at dentists, they're all natural paths. They're, they all try to um, exercise and eat right to avoid the pharmaceutical pill and the surgery. So congratulations to you for combining those two. So how, how closely related is nutrition to periodontal disease? Well, I don't think we could separate one from the other. I do believe the mouth is the gateway to one's health so if we uh, the mouth shows a lot of signs of inflammation in the body so for example if we're lacking iron you're going to get a red glossy tongue if you're lacking vitamin c we're going to get red bloody gums we know that scurvy is associated so i think we've stepped away from that as we've gotten more and more scientifically oriented we lost a little bit track of um, just the signs that we get from nutritional deficiencies. So periodontal disease is an inflammatory condition that's not just local. It's a systemic condition. So when the immune system is triggered, like it is in periodontal disease, it's not just triggered in the mouth. It's We see inflammation all over the body. And um, I work with quite a few integrative medical doctors here in Beverly Hills. And um, whenever they have somebody with high inflammatory markers, I check them for periodontal disease and inflammatory signs in the mouth because if we're going to treat the person, we have to look at the whole, the mouth and the body. You said you work with a lot of integrated doctors? Yes. Integrated medicine or functional medicine is a, is a newer branch in medicine and we have a lot of MDs or uh, DOs that are that are taking the extra step with functional medicine who's been around for more than 30 years to actually connect the different organ systems. Because, for example, now, uh, just like with a periodontist, you go to a periodontist, they just look at the gums. You go to a cardiologist, they just look at the heart. Then you go to a GI specialist, they just look at the intestines. But really, when the intestines are not functioning properly, we see problems with the heart, problems with the brain. So it's all connected. So functional medicine takes all in consideration all those organs and connects them together. So we had great results. You know, I I like the uh, Soviet Union model better where... Uh, dentists were a stomatology, just a branch of uh, they. all the MDs had the same undergrad the first two years of med school. Then they went off to become dermatologists or internal medicine or stomatologists. I, I think that was a better system than uh, what America did in 1880, where since the dentists needed a chair and the doctors needed a bed, they separated. And now 140 years later, they're coming back together. Yeah, it took us that long, but I'm glad to see, and I see this more in the medical community as well, where they're trying to uh, bridge the gap between dentists and and medical doctors as we need it desperately. Um, Twice a year, I go to medical conferences to see what's new in the medical community. And, and, you know, we have new diseases today, like metabolic syndrome, for example, it popped up. It's right before like a pre-diabetes stage where all the organs are involved, um, and diseases like chronic fatigue and, and leaky gut syndrome, for example. Um, and, and leaky gut syndrome, where the intestinal lining is inflamed, is very similar to periodontal disease, where the same thing, the lining of the pocket is leaking, so to speak. 
You know, um, of all the nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association, I think your specialty of periodontist changed more than all of them. I mean, 30, I mean, 30 years ago, it was all these gum surgeries and the patients hated it. And then when implants came out, everybody was so quick to, if in doubt, you know, pull any molar with periodontal disease in place with an implant. And now I see pulling all the perio-infected molars and replacing them with titanium. I see that pendulum starting to swing back now. I think a lot of people are um, thinking, well, number one, the patient decides if they want to pull their tooth and have an implant or, or try to keep their teeth. But, but the other thing that's... Um, I think the reason it's swinging back is periodontal surgery has gotten a lot less invasive than it was 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, it was always quadrant flaps. I mean, right down to the bone. Um, do, do you think periodontal disease, uh, treatment is getting less invasive than it was 30 years ago? Absolutely, uh, Howard. Everything's getting less invasive, not just uh, for dentistry, but also medical procedures. Everybody wants minimally invasive. And now, and you're right about what you said about uh, our profession as periodontists has changed so much and it will continue to change because um, with new advances in microbiology, we're starting to understand the role of the bacteria and how the biofilm gets to form and how the different bacteria plays a role in the biofilm. So now when we're looking at periodontal disease, we're like, let's do less surgery because whenever we cut something that's already infected, all that bacteria has a chance to get into the bloodstream. And we know this bacteria travels. Periodontal pathogens have been found in heart valves, uh, such as especially the highly aggressive periodontal pathogens, such as AA. We also found them in joints, in knees, in hips. Uh, they travel to the lungs, so we know they don't stay in the mouth. So for my practice, I've completely changed the model that I've learned uh, 12 years ago when I went to residency at UCLA. Essentially, we were taught flap surgery. But I've moved away from opening a flap, especially when we have that infection, and uh, finding out what or who is causing that periodontal infection with a saliva test called oral DNA, where somebody just simply swishes back and forth, they spit in a test tube, we send it to the lab, and we can find out within five days what microorganisms are causing that particular infection. And then from there, we offer non-surgical procedures such as uh, lasers and ozone, to be able to clean up the infection, also given nutritional support for inflammation. And together with this full mouth disinfection, we're able to get uh, great results without the, the, the painful surgeries that we had in the past. And you know, we always used to get the 3% recurrence of disease. Uh, we never were able to treat everyone. And uh, I'm a true believer that's because of these highly aggressive pathogens that we didn't even know they were there before because we treated everyone the same. Everybody got scaling and replaning, everybody got uh, osteosurgery, but we never really tested on a regular basis what kind of bacteria this patient has. And now we're changing that model to be a little bit more specific and less invasive. Almost everyone listening to this podcast is uh, commuting to work. They have an hour commute. Um, and they, they ask for two shows a day for their morning and evening commute, but since I can't take notes, I, I always do a transcript of the whole um, podcast and put it on uh, Dental Town, but I also retweet their last tweet. You're uh, at Dr. Sanda, S-A-N-D-A, and it's Sanda, it's Sanda. So you can find her there, and she's got her website link on there, or Twitter, Ask Dr. Sanda. And by the way, you're the only person I've ever podcasted who is verified on Twitter. How cool is that? That is amazing. Oh, yeah. So I, I yeah, got have I got 22,000 followers and you got 28. If I, When I get to 28, do I get verified or how does that work? <laughs> no, I think I'm sure you can get verified already. And I sent an email to Helene and she'll let you know how to do that. And, uh, I, and I also know why you've been on CBS, NBC, and all these uh, famous television shows because uh, you have a face for television. I have a face for a podcast. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> I, I only have a face for uh, for. Uh, uh, sound, but um, and I also you mentioned have the personality for television for sure. We're talking about integrative medicine and being a physician of the mouth. Um, what percent of dentists do you think have ever done any type of salivary testing? Uh, but actually, uh, I lecture nationwide on the topic of nutrition and and this concept, and I'm often sponsored by um, Noble Biocare to do this, and I'm very thankful for that. And I find that uh, less than 1% of dentists actually do an oral DNA test. Because I always ask you know, in my audience how many people actually do a salivary testing. 
and very, very few, and mainly because uh, oral DNA, uh, I guess, doesn't advertise. It was started by a periodontist, and it's been, I think, already they've been around for probably more than six years by now. And uh, it's such an easy test for dentists to be able to incorporate. Even uh, dental hygienists can do this uh, because it's simply a saliva swish and spit in a test tube. It can get easier than that. And then we get such good information from this. And not only that, the fact that we get good information, but it also, when a patient actually sees this kind of infection in their mouth, it connects them to their own disease. Because oftentimes, periodontal disease has no symptoms. So it's hard for patients to say, oh, you know, do I really have this problem? But when they're actually seeing how much bacteria is in their mouth, then uh, they have a tendency to, to get engaged in their treatment. Yeah, I, I think... Um... It's almost like the germ theory hasn't come to dentistry yet because you still go into dental offices where a hygienist will see the mom every three months for a periodontal cleaning for 10 years and she's never once seen her husband. And then her husband finally comes in and he's got a bombed out molar and he's got, you know, he's and it's like, you know, they're kissing. I mean, isn't there, you know, they're, they're giving this stuff. I, I've seen studies that says a single kiss can transmit 80 million microorganisms. I mean, how do you how do you treat the mom and not the dad for periodontal disease? Absolutely, I agree with you, and that's something that we actually stress in the office, especially in the high level of aggressive pathogens. Uh, when you get the report back for a patient, it actually says in there that this bacteria is transmissible. So, of course, seriously, it, can it actually says that. Yes. Oh yes, my so God, that is amazing. Uh, there's still dentists on Dental Town that deny it. Um, and, yeah. and, and as far as the microorganisms, um, Rilla Christian is a PhD uh, oral biologist, and she says that they're discovering a new species of bacteria every quarter in the mouth. So it may be even 100 more years. It could be 200 more years before we even know every name of every virus, bacteria, and fungi even living in the mouth. Absolutely, and, and that's exactly the point. It, it's not just bacteria. What we know is also parasites. Uh, you know, I work with this lab in Colorado called DNA Connections, and uh, I oftentimes, uh, they do this floss test, where you can floss and see what you have in the mouth. We don't know yet what to do with this information, but we're just kind of gathering data right now to see what exactly is living in the mouth. So they're testing things and bacteria, everything that they have markers for. We find parasites, we find viruses, we find uh, fungus, different species. So we know the biofilm is not just bacteria, as you say. And you're right, right now it's just, I think, just the beginning of microbiology studies in, in the mouth. But it, it, periodontal disease will change the way we look at it and the way we treat it, for sure. And, and what is this uh, DNA connections? How are they different than oral DNA? What, what, what's the difference there? So uh, DNA connections, uh, they do things a little bit differently. They also, also uh, biopsy things that are uh, deep inside the jawbone. So for example, um, uh, one of the practitioners who works uh, with me is an endodontist. And oftentimes we biopsy things that are at the apex of the root canal teeth because we're also trying to understand what's living in there. So um, DNA connections, we use them mostly for a deeper kind of uh, test to see what microorganisms are living inside the jawbone. Um, but also some patients can contact them directly. They don't actually need to go to a physician to have one of their tests. So um, DNA connections offers what's called a floss test where you can actually floss all your teeth, put the floss in a little baggie and send it in the mail and they'll tell you what's living in your mouth. But we don't know what to do with that information really. Right? We're not there yet. Okay, I just found them on Twitter. They are at DNA Connections, and their last tweet, what is Lyme disease and what are the symptoms to look for? And let's see if there's anything more dental. Yes, and actually a lot of the physicians I work with... Uh, are chronic disease physicians and they do treat Lyme disease and we do see a strong association between oral infections and Lyme disease. And uh, we see more and more patients, younger patients with Lyme disease and um, uh, oral DNA, or, uh, DNA connections offers one of the best tests for Lyme disease. And um, why, why we're on that, uh, I, I noticed um, when, when you're integrative, natural, nutritionist, What's your view on the silver filling? Because it contains uh, mercury, silver, zinc, copper, tin. Is that a, is that a no-no in your mind, or is that a, or what do you think? 
Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because today, this morning, I was reading the ADA uh, a journal, and they were actually talking about California Proposition 65, which, uh, you know, goes in effect next year. And we actually have to post in every dental office in California the harmful uh, mercury in the amalgam. We actually have to make it official that if we take out amalgam, we have to put up a sign saying, hey, this is, you know, causes, uh, it's a neurotoxin, it causes uh uh, birth defects and other things. So uh, I think we have enough evidence now to, to for all of us to realize, yes, the mercury in amalgam does cause a problem. It's a neurotoxin. And, uh, uh, you know, I know uh, one of my dentist friends in Portland, she actually had to quit dentistry for a couple of years because she her uh, mercury levels were so high from removing uh, amalgam fillings that uh, she had blurry vision, headaches, so uh, she had to quit chelate all the mercury out of her system and, and finally she's getting back to work slowly. So uh, and I, I tested my own mercury level in the blood and I highly encourage all dentists to take test their mercury level and see how high it really is because we are getting affected, not only us but also the patients, uh, but especially as health practitioners, as dentists, we are exposed uh, to high levels of mercury 2,000 times more when we actually take an amalgam out in the air than the EPA even allows. So it is definitely a neurotoxin that we should all be careful of. So do you take any extra precautions when you remove them? Absolutely, so for, I don't remove amalgams. I do mostly uh, extraction of teeth who have mercury fillings, but I never cut into a mercury filling. I, if I have to cut the tooth, I will cut around the mercury filling and not actually cut through the filling itself. Uh, here in our office, uh, I have a, we have a multi-specialty office, so the dentists uh, I work with, they take precautions. They use the SMART certification from uh, IOMT, and we have um, the vacuum to suck out all the vapors that come from the mercury, and we use a rubber dam uh, to ensure that, that we kind of trap these mercury vapors and we don't inhale them. You know, and e even if we never place an amalgam again, we would be drilling them out for a century. And, and actually, the, um, the worst thing about a silver filling, which was the nail in the coffin, was that um, when you look at environmental uh, mercury in the air, 50% of it comes from burning coal, but 6% of it comes from cremating humans who have silver fillings in their amalgams. I mean, California, if they wanted to get a great lid on it, it would at least pass a law that somebody has to go in and extract the molars. You can't, you can't cremate a human that has, you know, a half dozen MOD amalgams in their mouth because it's, it's all hot, it's heated, it's uh, cr crazy. But I, I wanna go back to um, um, patients hate surgery. They hate periodontal surgery. And a lot of them emotionally don't wanna lose it too. So I wanna go back to non-invasive. Um, you, you talked about microbiological testing. Um, I know LANAP came out uh, um, years back. A lot of people uh, um, are using lasers. Are you using lasers? Uh, yes, I've used lasers now for 10 years. And uh, uh, I'm more a, of a BioLace user. And the reason why I like the BioLace um, YSGG or the Erbumiag lasers is because uh, they have the ability to affect hard tissue. A LANAP is really just a soft tissue laser. It's essentially a diode laser, but I prefer something because when I treat pockets that are nine millimeters deep, I actually want to recontour the bone on a closed flap situation. I want to get the osteoblasts, I want to perforate little micro perforations of the bone to be able to get the osteoblasts to come out of the bone level. So in my hands, the, the YSGG uh, water lace works great in, in the reestablishing periodontal health in moderate to advanced periodontitis. Case. You're saying it's the water lace YSGG? Yes, it's YSGG. And uh, water and and how if you did a hundred um, quadrants, what percent of the time would you use the laser? Ninety-nine percent of the time, I rarely will flap a case because I, I do see bone regenerating, even an angular bony defect. And I actually did one of the cases for the doctor's TV show on CBS so on my website. You can uh, that, that particular patient had advanced periodontal disease and 10 millimeter pockets that have fully, uh, fully been um, eradicated just by using the laser and not having to do um, 
major uh, flap surgery. You know, um, when I when I think of you, you know, um, periodontal disease, it's amazing how this oral systemic health, the the what's motivating the the medical insurance companies the most is that the association between uh, gum disease and premature birth, and that's their most expensive line item ticket. It's about a million dollars cash to have a preemie, and some of these CEOs are starting to look at um, that when you insure someone with medical coverage, if it doesn't include dental coverage for the pregnant mom, you're gonna have to get out your checkbook. What, what do you think about the association of um, gingivitis, periodontal disease, and premature babies? Well, we know from periodontal research, Dr. Offenbach, uh, he published papers showing that the um, moms with uh, periodontal disease uh, have babies and they give birth earlier and their babies are low uh, birth weight. So um, we know that the, this bacteria travels to the amniotic fluid. It has an effect for sure. It creates inflammation and in turn, uh, then uh, we have preterm low birth weight babies. So uh, definitely, I think we should work more with OBGYNs. And, uh, you know, I wonder if how many OBGYNs really look in the mouth when somebody comes to them pregnant, saying, hey, how is your periodontal condition? Do you know that this can affect your baby and encourage them to actually have um, a visit with a periodontist to ensure their mouth is healthy? You know, it's... <laughs> It still cracks me up because I, I've gotten a physical every year for 30 years, and every time they go to the mouth, he says, open up, and he looks there at this life like one second, and then he's done. And I'm thinking, okay, I've been a dentist for 30 years. What the hell could you have just done? I mean, it's like, open up, say, aw, aw, and it's like, okay. And then, he, then yeah. he throws the popsicle stick in the trash can and moves on to other body parts. I'm just like, that, I, I, I almost can't quit laughing. So, um, so when, you, when you're do, treating a standard patient, or gum disease and you're using your laser and all that stuff what percent of the time when you're done with your periodontal specialist hat do you put on your nutrition hat and start talking nutrition do you give supplements what how, how does that work um so in my office i've created a program so when somebody has inflammation in the mouth we do what is called a full mouth disinfection and that includes automatically uh, nutritional support and we have such great evidence today that certain um, uh, supplements are key to decreasing in inflammation in the body. And of course, not just supplements, because I'm a true believer that the diet and lifestyle influences um, how things heal. So definitely we have a chart. We talk to patients about what to eat. Uh, we help them with substitutions. Not like I'm not of the opinion that we should cut out everything that we really like, everything that we're addicted to all of a sudden. We just have to find good substitutions for patients in order, for example, sugar. There's so many great substitutes for sugar today um, that are uh, could be even anti-inflammatory or uh, promote the health of uh, the mouth, such as xylitol or trehalose. Um, we have also monk fruit drops that are good sugar substitutes. So things that are a little bit more natural, uh, non-artificial uh, to help get off have the russians invented a vodka yet made out of xylitol so you drink it and not get diabetic and all <laughs> that'd be good but you know whoever yep. invented that be... they, they were first in satellites uh with sputnik why don't you send uh, their dental society and say since you guys drink most of the vodka in the world why don't you make a xylitol vodka think they could do it <laughs> those russians i tell you they study microbiology unbelievably well so i'm sure they have a method <laughs> they, they have they have probably one of the most disciplined education systems in the world. They do, and you I know mean, what they're studying? I was actually talking to one of their researchers. They're studying uh, to to do bacterial testing based on their quantum vibration. So they're going back to quantum physics. So instead of being a blood test, a lava test, they're they're just basically testing the quantum vibration and being able to tell what kind of bacteria is uh, present in that infection instantly without waiting the five days. So, so I want you, we, we just had 6,000 kids graduating dental, 56 dental schools uh, last week. Um, since I've got out of school, you know, indemnity insurance paying 1,000 for a root canal, now it's 95% of dentists take PPOs if you consider Delta. Um, you know, Delta is a PPO. Um, and at least um, 
82%, take two or more PPOs. And a lot of dentists listening um, to people like you say, well, I'm not going to do it unless there's an insurance code. What would you say to the graduating class when they go get a job with some old fart in Parsons, Kansas, and he won't do anything unless there's a billable code for it, and he just sits down and he drills, fills, and bills uh, insurance codes all day? What, what would you say to the, the graduating class? Uh so insurance codes are revised every year, and we actually do have insurance codes for a microbiological sample, for saliva tests. There's actually codes for that, and they're definitely billable. And there's also codes for nutritional um, counseling in the dental office. So that is actually a billable code. Interesting. I, I really hope you write an article with Dental Town Magazine on this, uh, Periodontal Nutrition, because I've had that magazine since 1994, and I've never seen the it's it's kind of like uh who got peanut butter on my chocolate um you know and uh um i i think it's really a really uh, neat mix and what's really exciting about dental town magazine which is crazy is um since it's online it's actually more people read it digitally than the hundred and twenty five thousand we mail it to i mean this internet it is so it is so romantic when you get emails from um little girl dentist in Somalia and Ethiopia and, and uh, you know, Cambodia saying they, they look forward to it every month. But uh, th th this is, is truly new. Um, what about, uh, in, speaking of Soweto, when you lecture in uh, South Africa, they're, they like ozone, and it really never took off in the United States. What, what are your thoughts? Why, why do the South Africans, who are also brilliant, why are they into ozone and the Americans aren't? Uh, uh, you know, that's interesting because we should be. Ozone's been around for more, more than 100 years. Nikola Tesla developed the first ozone machine for, for medicine in 1898. So uh, it was actually very popular during that time because we didn't have antibiotics. But what really happened with us uh, as the antibiotics came on the market, the ozonator fell out of favor because somebody had to have a machine, you have to go to the office. It's much easier to write a prescription uh, to give it to somebody and have them treat the infection. And, and it was fine then, and it was taking care of a lot of infections, but now we're seeing that a lot of bacterial resistance is popping up with uh, with recurrent infections. So we're, we're try starting to move towards something that uh, cannot cause resistance. And, and that's what I see with ozone. And ozone, you know, being three atoms of oxygen, and we have that one oxygen that comes off and it starts basically poking holes in all the membranes of bacteria and parasites and it doesn't discriminate. So it really has the ability to wipe out on contact any, let's say, pathogenic biofilm, not just one bacteria, like for example, as we do with antibiotics. Because really antibiotics don't get rid of parasites, don't get rid of viruses, whereas ozone does. So I started using it in my office, I would say probably about four years ago now, and uh, especially for periodontal disease where we're dealing with biofilms, we're dealing with pathogens, it's made a world of difference. And who, what, what, it's a machine you're using? Who makes the machine? Uh, there's different companies now who make the machine, and there's actually good news. If you, uh, one of the dentists here in California, uh, he has a, a machine called TheraZone. He, it just got FDA approval for making ozonated water. So um, I think we're, we're slowly moving towards, you know, getting ozonators out there. Because for us, especially to use ozonator water to clean the dental lines, which we know are full of gunk in there, you know, I think it was on 60 Minutes that they were uh, uncovering how dirty the dental lines are. So ozonated water, we actually flush those lines with no problem. And it's called Therazone. Therazone, yes. Therazone. Man, you are a world of information. Um, so, is, okay, I just found it. Um, so the website is Ther. T H E R O Z O N E Therazone. Therazone. And you said you said a dentist made that. Yeah, and he's actually I, I keep meaning to go visit him, and he's on my list. Definitely, he's out in uh, in the Santa Monica area, and uh, you know it's so hard to get a fee approval for anything. So, uh, hats off to him for for actually going the, those steps to be able to get this machine a fee approved because that was the biggest complaint before. We don't have any ozonators FDA approved, although there's many things in dentistry that don't have that the approval when we're using. Well, speak, speaking of that, uh, the graduating class is, uh, you know, they're young and they're, they're learning communication skills. Well, and what, one of the things they complain about on Dentaltown is that um, 
when they tell people to floss, they say, the New York Times said there's not a shred of evidence on flossing. And um, you just said, you know, there's a lot of things we use uh, FDA approved. What verbal skills would you give a 24-year-old kid who's telling some old man to floss? And he says, maybe you should read the New York Times because if you did, you'd find out. <laughs> There's none. What, what, what would you, what do you say to patients who say that? Um, well, uh, that, that's a good question, Howard. It's like, uh, if we actually listen to everything that FDA actually comes out with, uh, we'd probably be dead right now because they put drugs on the market. They say, oh, this drug is totally safe. And then a few years later, the drug is, you know, kills uh, a bunch of people and then they take it off the market. So I think we really have to look at the research and, and use common sense. Um, and, and, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And, and it takes really years for something to get FDA approved. Um, and during those years, sometimes 10 years, I, I, one of my colleagues is trying to get a, a supplement for chronic fatigue FDA approved. He's been in the process for 10 years and it's still not there. Does the, does the product work? Yes. And it's all natural. And he's been using it. He's been shelved trial after trial. So as soon as I, I suggest to those young graduates to go look at the research or ask an expert who has looked at the research. What does the research show? Is this product detrimental to one's health or is it not? Ozone, for example, is all natural. We know that it also has an immune effect. It stimulates the immune system. It doesn't just kill organisms. So it stimulates our one's immune system to um, uh, clear up the inflammation and the infection. And uh, there's lots of papers from all over the world. Europeans use it. Australians use it. It's not one of these things that just popped up. If something has been in use for a long time and has good research, then I suggest uh, to them to go and learn more about it and use it. I want you to address another very common complaint. All these kids who just graduate, they say, I, I just graduated in dental school and we never placed one implant. And it'd be easy for you to go from a thousand implants to a thousand and one, but she's got to go from zero to one. And she's standing out there looking at, you know, um, what, what advice would you give her? And the other, the other problem that she says is says in America, so much of the implant uh, training is tied to the company. They almost get paralyzed first because they think they have to find the perfect implant system first because all the training is tied into the implant. And, and there's over 175 implants that are sold at the ADA convention. So give yeah. her some coaching advice. How does she go from zero to one? Because you're, I mean, you're teaching it at UCLA. Um, did, did the UCLA students, when they graduated, they, had they placed an implant? Uh, yes, and not the students themselves, though. You actually have to be in an AGD program or you have to be in a residency program. Uh, and it's unfortunate when I hear these things that still dental schools have not really implemented implants uh, in their teaching uh, facilities because uh, they really are the standard of care instead of bridges. And unfortunately, only about what, 20%. 20 to 30 percent of dentists are using implants right now. So uh, some guidelines to recommend where to look for classes is one, a pick a company that uh, has at least five years of research to know that you're offering that patient a uh, good solution. So the success rate for implants today in a, in a 10 year period uh, is really should be over 95 percent. But if a company doesn't have that yet and it's only been there for like two to five years, they don't put money into the research. I wouldn't recommend going with that particular type of implant just to save some money because I think our reputation is the most important thing after all, especially as a young dentist. You want to establish a good reputation from the beginning. And then there's so many courses out there, and I know working with the uh, uh, implant education for 10 years, you can find it as part of universities, a continuing education, or even uh, the implant companies, the most reputable implant companies, they have great courses um, that they offer um, hands-on as well. I just gave a course actually in Portland, Oregon on pig jaws, and that's a great way to learn before going on patient, to, to use something to simulate before you actually go into a patient's uh, mouth and find a mentor. That's the other thing. You know, I'm more than happy to mentor uh, a young graduates who want to learn the right way to do dental implants. So I think general dentists, some of the general dentists have great surgical skills and they should really look into um, adding implant surgery into their practices and I'm happy to mentor um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure she's listening to this as she's driving to work and she's thinking, I want to know what Sonda uses. What, what does Sonda use? What are you teaching at UCLA? 
So uh, we work with Nova Biocare exclusively. Um, and, you know, Nova Biocare has the most research that they've done uh, over the years. And uh, I use mostly now Noble Active. Uh, Noble Active is an, like a corkscrew type implant, and I use it a lot in immediate cases. Uh, teeth in a day when we use full arch restorations. Um, uh, and one of these surges we actually did for the doctor is the, what we replaced upper broken teeth with four implants, the all on four treatment concept and a full arch bridge. Because uh, let's face it, a lot of people are afraid of going into dentures, especially some, a lot of my women patients, they do not even want to see themselves without teeth. And they say, you know, I, I just don't want to wake up in the middle of this. I just don't want to see that I have a denture. So uh, this kind of replacement, especially with an implant that's had great research and uh, the all on four treatment concept has had now 20 year research, we know has high predictability if done correctly. And that was with a uh, Palo, is it Palo Malo? How do you pronounce that? Palo Malo? Palo Malo, yes. Palo and Malo? Yes, and I was fortunate enough to, I'm very thankful for his teachings. I went to his facility in Portugal and I spent a week over there just to, you know, to learn from the best really. And he developed this technique 20 years ago and nobody believed him that uh, this will actually work that four implants could support a whole bridge long-term. And finally, after 20 years, when we actually have the research to know it's predictable, a lot of people are, are um, getting on board with this because it's a great treatment for patients and it's a treatment that saves people money because uh, we don't have to do sinus lifts, we don't have to do bone grafts that typically drive up the cost. So you, um, you like doing all on fours? I do. I think it's so gratifying for me to, to, you know, to see people's smiles after the fact. You know, to yeah. go from, uh, I, I don't from uh, ever... really sitting at home. We have a lot of women that actually sit at home. They're men. They just... I, uh, I don't think we've ever published an all-on-4 case on Dentaltown. Maybe, maybe that, uh, there's another idea of an article to publish in Dentaltown. Can you hear me? Oh, sure. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah, I could hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, Lisbon, Portugal. That's that was the first um, European. That was the first city outside of America that I ever saw when I was uh, 16 years old. Uh, I went to a Catholic school, and they had this um, um, this I don't know uh, what do you call it, a recruitment uh, trip. So they loaded up a 747, but they, every year they'd put 450 uh, Catholic high school boys from Kansas fly them to Lisbon, Portugal, and Fatima, and all that stuff. And every year they'd get about 10 conversions that would cancel their flight home and join the priesthood. So my, my mom tried so hard uh, and she sent me on that trip. She was so hoping uh, that I would switch from a uh, dentistry to priesthood, but uh, this little, but uh, didn't work out. Um, so, so you like the Noble BioCare, you like the Noble Active, you're doing all on four, but um, how long would it take a 24 year old graduate from dental school to go all the way from I've never placed one to someday I'm placing all on four. I mean, that, that, that's a long journey. Where do you think she should start at? So I, I think, you know, they get probably some basics in, in dental school about dental implants. But if somebody is never placing one implant, I would say start small. Start with a single implant. And, uh, you know, my, my rule for this is always if you don't know how to treat the complications, don't do the procedure. Because uh, I think the most important thing is learning how to deal with complications. And of course, they arise, you know, rarely. However, if you don't know how to deal with them and you don't have somebody to help you deal with them, then, and then that's a problem. We're not really serving the patients. And of course, things happen to everyone. Like uh, my mentor, Sasha Jovanovic, uh, he, he says, you know, if you haven't um, gotten a complication, it means you haven't placed enough implants because they will arise. Everybody heals at different rates. Uh, things happen, the bone quality can be poor to start out with, so things will fail. It's just learning how to deal with that. That's probably the most important thing in, in implant therapy. So I would say start small and you know, do single implants, not in the aesthetic zone. Start with a premolar or molar site where you have a lot of bone. Once you get comfortable with that, uh, you know, take a bone graft course and then do a, an implant and a bone graft. And then uh, just keep, Keep getting a little larger, do an implant bridge, and then probably after you get comfortable with that, then go into the, the all-on-4 treatment concept. But in terms of restoration, um, a skilled surgeon and a lab technician who's done many all-on-4s can definitely uh, guide a, dental, a young dental into restoring these cases properly. 
I'm, I'm going to ask you the most controversial implant question on the dental town boards. And I want you to know that no matter what you say, half of uh, the dentists will disagree and the other half will agree. That is a lot of people say, like, like you said, you need to learn how to be able to deal with the complications. A lot of the everyone who's placed a thousand to 10,000 implants say you need to lay a flap and see the bone and you need to be a surgeon. But the millennials are saying, I don't want to lay a flap. I want to make a surgical guide and I just want to punch through the tissue. Then the old guys are saying, that's like putting training wheels on your bicycle. You got, you're, you're a doctor, you're a surgeon. You got to put the, the scalpel to the bone. So my question to you exactly is, when she starts her journey and is looking for something not in the aesthetic zone, a premolar or molar, would you recommend a surgical guide or would you recommend getting a scalpel and going to bone? Uh, you know, when I did my residency, actually, we didn't start dental implants until we learned to deal with flaps. And my and my resident, uh, my director of the program of, at UCLA, he said, you know, you guys have to learn to manage flaps before you do implants, because if you don't close the flap properly, your implant can fail or you can have problems or recession and things like that. So I think it's definitely key to learn how to do flaps and learning on an animal model, for example, if somebody who's already graduated is great, like pig jar or sheep head, there's lots of animal models out there. Uh, that somebody can start learning flaps. And then I believe that flapless procedures are a little more advanced of a procedure because you already have to kind of imagine what the bone looks like, like underneath. And uh, I know guided surgery is, is a thing that uh, of the future. And I love guided surgery. I used a, a Nobel clinician to be able to kind of simulate the surgery before we go in there so I can, we can treat my plan better and uh, understand what could happen and things like that. But it's still not, it, not a, a foolproof. Uh, we still have to know in case that implant doesn't engage properly to be able to raise a flap and correct the situation for sure. Um, another problem um, dentists are having in the, uh, in, out in the field is that, you know, patients come in with periimplantitis and you know they have no pain they're chewing they're eating and you have periimplantitis what, what is the what do you think is the incidence of periimplantitis on implants placed in america 10 years ago and what and how are you treating that uh and, uh, this is actually a topic periimplantitis is a topic i talk about uh, nationwide because it's such a problem we know the statistics today uh this was published in j perio just last year one in five patients will develop periimplantitis within five years. One in five patients, and that's, that, that's really scary because we're offering a treatment that could potentially last a lifetime. But uh, I think, you know, as a, as a student even, I remember going to the conferences and into the years to, after that, and I hear a lot about how to do dental implants, but nobody really took the time to spend time on how do we maintain these implants long-term, and that's something that uh, I'm very passionate about kind of spreading the message. We do have some uh, recent guidelines. Um, we had a consensus in Europe uh, and like uh, 10 of the best clinicians got together and say, okay, how can we help prevent hairy implant diseases? And they put some guidelines together, which have been published um, to help the practitioner maintain the implant long term. Because right now we're just telling patients, okay, well, here's your implant. This is what I hear a lot. Um, and just brush and floss normally. But that's not really correct. For example, just using an oral irrigator around an implant, we can increase uh, the longevity of that implant because floss doesn't clean properly. We really, oral irrigator versus string floss, we know oral irrigators clean much better. So even as simple as that, something as simple as that, it should be incorporated in the uh, implant treatment plan. You know why I think patients don't like um, using the water uh, pick? Because it's so... Thing messy and I was uh, it's I was so excited to see that water pick now has a rechargeable water pick that you can take into the shower and what I always have is on mine is the shower floss because when you're water picking or, or water flossing in the shower no one cares where the water goes but when you're at your kitchen sink and there's splashes all over the room I, I think they think it's messy and then moms will get one and then their kids come in and start using it and the next thing they do is that they, they, they want to put it under the cabinet. So I, I think the, uh, the shower floss and that new water pick one that you can carry, that you can fill up and carry into the shower um, is, uh, would be better for that. So, so you were talking about that you could prevent it better with, uh, instead of brush and floss regularly, getting a water pick. Or, or do you have a brand? You're a periodontist. What, what brand do you like? 
Um, I use different brands. I think what uh, I like personally uh, a portable one. And of course, Water Pick is the most well known brand out there. And they do have the portable, they have the shower pick one, and they have the one that by the kitchen sink. But I myself love, love a portable one. And uh, my portable water pick is even black, so it matches everything else and it stays clean. So nowadays you can find really <laughs> cool designs for portable oral irrigators. <laughs> what, what, is, what is the brand uh, of that? Um, I actually use something called Poseidon. It's just Poseidon. a smaller water pick that I easily use. Poseidon, yeah. Uh, did you ever see the movie The Poseidon Adventure? <laughs> I haven't seen it, but you know, I, the God of the Seas, so it must yeah, be a God good movie. Sea. That, that was a great movie. That was just a classic movie. There were so many uh, stars in that movie of the Poseidon Adventure. They were on a Greek cruise, and there was an earthquake, and the boat got flipped over. But uh, so that's how I remember that. So, so Poseidon makes an oral <laughs> irrigator. That's the name of the company. That's the name of the company. Yeah. Did you find yeah. it? So we, just, we like it because it's inexpensive and people have a tendency to try it, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's a lower cost, but I, I love it because it's smaller, it's more compact, so, uh, so you can take it in the shower, as you said, you, know, you don't have to make a mess. So you, you talked about prevention, you said you can't just brush and floss, use an oral irrigator, you recommend a Poseidon, um, what other things to prevent and then, and then go to uh, treat the 20% the, the, the that have it? So what, what other things were they saying to prevent it? And then, and then let's say they already have it, they're that 20%, how do you treat it as a periodontist? Uh, the other big problem that I see out there is um, we don't recognize mucositis, let's say peri-implant mucositis, which is the initial inflammation of the gums around the implant without uh, penetrating into the bone. Uh, if we start recognizing that when it first starts, we see the bleeding, uh, upon probing right away, then we can do something about it right away. But I think what happens is, in, especially uh, as a specialist, I see these implants when they actually have, you know, advanced peri-implantitis already. So um, I think we should learn to recognize the signs. If somebody comes in for, for hygiene maintenance and their implant is bleeding, that's the time to do something about it. If we keep telling the patient, oh, just go home and brush and floss some more, it's not going to work. So at that time, I think we should be more proactive into recommending them something different for oral hygiene, but also uh, doing some um, ozone treatments or uh, laser treatments to help tighten that tissue again. And also recognizing uh, when we have very thin tissue around an implant, that also uh, creates a problem with bone loss. So being proactive and into grafting these sites and maintaining healthier and thicker periodontium or peri-implant tissues would be ideal and then and then as far as treating it when you see it do you um do you flap that i mean do you try to regenerate bone around uh, implants when they've lost bone or is, is that very successful or is that more of a pipe dream My, the implant needs to come out and be replaced yeah unfortunately once the implant has lost bone we don't really have a good predictable way uh to um to really uh, rebuild this bone back. My favorite way to grow bone back around an implant is using lasers. And there's a peri-implant protocol, again, with the water lace, with the YSGG, to help uh, regenerate the bone and uh, you know repair the bone around an implant. Um, with bone grafting te technique, when we have to raise a flap, I really, really reserve that for, for a larger bone graft, more than 50%, for example. But often, uh, the, the limitation is the fact that, again, the biofilm gets into the implant surface and we just can't clean it out before we do the bone graft. So it's best oftentimes to just take the implant out if it's, the bone loss is over 50% and just uh, place a new one with, with the new bone regeneration. So are you buying that Poseidon uh, toothbrush from toilet tree products? Toilet tree products? <laughs> is that where you get it? Yes. Yeah, Ryan yeah. found it for me, and so I just uh, retweeted uh, them. Uh, I never even heard of it, uh, and but they're following me. They're at Toilet Tree Prod for Toilet Tree, uh, a play on Toilet Trees. I think it's yeah. pretty cute. <laughs> so a Toilet Tree, uh, I'm sure Toilet Tree was already taken. So they're Toilet Tree Products, and I, I retweeted that deal, and I and I saw the uh, the picture of it on the website. Uh, I could see. Uh, I uh, w when is Father's Day next? Not this Sunday. What next Sunday? I think so. I don't even know. Yeah. So. Make sure. So here it is. I'm going to tell oh, yeah. Ryan. Ryan, that's what you need to get your dad for Father's <laughs> Day. Come on, Ryan. Bye.
Actually, you know, the portable one is even better than that one. I think that's their sink model. But oh, they that's have a sink model? Uh-huh. And they also got a sonic toothbrush. Oh, you mean, okay, so right right there, that one? That's it. Yeah, that's the one. Nice. I, I, I never even heard of them before. Um, huh. Very interesting. Um, so, um, UCLA has a uh, an implant residency, though, don't they? The, or, I mean, um, that general dentist can um, can take. Yes, they have a one year implant residency. Also, uh, there's Global Institute uh, for uh, Dental Education Guide. They also have a one year master's program, uh, and I'm also involved with them in terms of uh, teaching properly. And and you know, the nice thing about taking a one year residency is that as as oh, somebody starting with implants they have a place where they can bring their cases and say okay this is my case this is what i'm having difficulty with what do you think i should do here so it's a it's a nice way to um to have a support group so you're on the you're on the faculty with with guide g-i-d-e yes yes dr sasha jovanovic founded that he was my implant mentor and i am very grateful i learned a lot of uh, my uh, surgical skills from him and um he has asked me to come on board and, and help with, with the classes there. So what does GUIDE stand for? GUIDE is Global Institute for Dental Education. Global Institute for Dental Education. And is that, um, and where, where is that in Southern Cal? That's uh, very close to Beverly Hills, uh, probably maybe four miles away. It's on the West LA area. And where's the, uh, where's the UCLA uh uh, and UCLA is in Westwood, also about you know four miles away from Beverly Hills. So, so you'd recommend both of those, or would you recommend one more than the other? Uh, I do. I do recommend both of them. Uh, and of course, there's other great programs in the country that that have a one-year residency. Also, Loma Linda, for example, their program is actually two years. It's a little bit more involved, so it really depends. Uh, but the nice thing about uh, you know. A weekend program over one year is that somebody can still practice. They don't have to give up their practice in order to learn a new skill. Do you, what do you what do you think of this uh, new trend where you um, um, go outside the United States to like Mexico or uh, the Caribbean um, and place a bunch of implants there where you're free from lawyers and all that stuff? Um, some people say it's a great experience because you get a place. 10, 20, 30 implants, but then other people say, well, the most important thing is to see those patients 30, 60, 90 days later and follow them a year later. And if you're not going to see uh, that, that patient again, you're not learning. What, what What's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I tend to agree with a, a latter thing that you said that it's, it's, it's nice to be able to follow up the treatment of, of the patients to see, you know, how is the healing? Is the patient having pain? How are you managing those conditions? I think Literally, placing an implant is easy. Anybody can put an implant into any bone. But, you know, do, did we give the enough prosthetic support for this implant to be restored properly? Did we take care of the tissue properly, you know? Um, is it is patient in pain a lot? Are most of the patients in pain? Maybe something with my surgical technique. I'm burning the bone. So I think follow-through is, is most important with any surgery. So how much are these, uh, how much is the one-year residency at Guide or UCLA? How much uh, investment is this going to be? So they run anywhere, I think, from about $8,000 to, you know, $16,000, uh, depending on the type of program and, uh, you know, where you have it. And, of course, I think the Loma Linda is even more than that because it's a yearly program, but it's more of a, uh, somebody has to give up their practice to, to go there. And that's even more expensive, I think, twenty or 30000 Yeah, so, um, and, and then uh, last thing, you've been so adorable giving me an hour of your busy life. Um, My pleasure. I only got, I'm, at fifth, I'm uh, almost out of time, but I want to, um, I also want to ask you, do you think this is true, this statement is true or false? Um, you know, a lot of dentists, um, to, I believe that the critical mass for a doctor is you got to do it once a week. I, I, I don't see any evidence that someone who does an Invisalign case three times a year is fast, high quality, efficient, and profitable. Um, these people will start learning sleep apnea and they'll do two cases a year. Um, den dentists that make one denture a year, oh my God, they're horrible. Um, I, I, do, you think, do you think if you get into this implant, so it, it's an investment of eight, 10, 17,000, well, 
you can recoup that. You yeah. know, implants are a thousand apiece. I mean, seventeen implants. Um, but do you believe that you have to place one implant a week or do one dental procedure a week to really reach critical mass? And the flip side of that question is: say you needed a surgery, would you want to go to a doctor who does that surgery every three months, or would you like to go find a doctor who does that surgery at least every week? Yeah. Yeah, you have a good point there. And I do think if somebody starts doing dental implants, maybe a way to uh, um, motivate patients to come in is definitely you know, to offer them a lower cost. But I think recognizing what cases are, are good to do, like the simple cases, especially in the beginning, where you know it's not too stressful and it, it, everything goes smoothly and then they can tell other people, oh, you know, this was great. Uh, and also, you know, I started with my family members when I was oh, a resident. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, luckily I had enough family members there so I practiced them a good 20 implants before uh, my patients but I think there's ways to build a practice with uh, with dental implants and uh, I was recently in Arizona actually in Phoenix and there was one general dentist there who actually uh, changed his business models and uh, model and now he's just really taking referrals and all he does is dental implants, and he takes referrals from other general dentists, although he himself is a general dentist. So I think you're amazing. I mean, and how did you uh, how did you get to be the contributor to the Huffington Post? I mean, those guys are crushing it on the internet. I mean, when the New York Times and the LA Times are still trying to build up their newspaper delivery thrown on your driveway, the Huffington Post just aimed at the internet and crushed it, and and they got and you got uh, to be their contributor. Congratulations on all that. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, really, I think anyone can can apply to be a, a, a provider for the Huffington Post, a contributor. They're just looking for new ideas, fresh ideas, something new, a new way of looking at things. And uh, that's really it. And you know, I I started my journey uh, after dental school with my interest in nutrition, and I just started going to medical conferences and just starting to connect things. And it was just a passion. And uh, I su I submitted an article, and uh, then they accepted it. And uh, uh, I'm happy to bring new ideas, uh, you know, for the world. Well, you know what? I, I always tell the young kids, you know, they're they're worried about their student loans. I said, well, you know, you need to learn how to hustle. You need a strong worth ethic, work ethic. You need to be um, humble, listen to older dentists, colleagues, other people. But, you know, when I started my practice 30 years ago, I went over and invited every single pharmacist over my house for dinner. And then I started doing it with the physicians and and. There's uh, there, there's dentists listening in podcasts where there's a medical dental building across the street with eight MDs in there, and they, they've never even gone over there and knocked on their door. And I think um, network, I mean, healthcare is 17% of the economy. That means 17 cents of every dollar is healthcare. Um, this year will be the first year it passes $3 trillion, and there's uh, uh, 1 million MDs in the United States. And especially in smaller towns, why would you not? I mean, you got to get out and press the flesh, run for mayor, invite them over your house, take them to dinner. Um, I can't believe, and, and of all the referrals, uh, the ones that send me the most are still the pharmacists. So many people go to a pharmacist and ask what's the best uh, Anbisol to put on a toothache or, you know, which one you know, is a leave better or Motrin. And Brad will say, you know what you need to do? You need to call my buddy Howard. And I mean, it just uh, so yeah. So you're out there pressing the flesh with the MDs, networking with the whole healthcare community, and yeah. no wonder you're crushing it in Beverly Hills. I mean, that, that that's amazing. Thank you. You're right, as you said. You know, it's it's work is is networking absolutely, and it's you know ultimately we can treat the patients so much better when we have a good network of health practitioners. And uh, as a Young practitioner, there's so many new grads coming out today. Definitely have to think out of the box and, and be out there and spread the word of uh, your skills and your beliefs. But I, and I want to end on on a dark note. I, I I don't want you to think I'm playing you, but here here's the deal. Dental Town Magazine, its number one complaint for over five or ten years is how come every time an article is written by a dentist, it's always a man. And if a girl writes an article, it's always a hygienist or a consultant. Our team, it is so hard to get content from women, dentists, role model leaders. And we tell, you know, the dental school class is half women. I mean, it's, it's gone from a mostly male to 50-50 uh, um, male, female. And so, I, so you young girls out there listening, I mean, trust me, there's not one, 
we got 50 employees. There's not one single employee that hasn't been told a hundred times. We need more content from women. As young women in dental school, they totally gravitate towards women role models. It's, it's just a natural thing. It's, it's kind of like when your grandkids are over. Your, 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 your grandkids will spend time with grandpa until another little kid walks in. But as soon as another three or four year old kid walks in, your, your grandkid's gone, you know? And uh, they everyone gravitates yeah. to, if you're a young 24 year old woman dentist, you don't want to listen to some old fat bald guy. You, you want to see what women dentists are crushing it. And uh, so thanks for being a role model to so many women dentists out there. And uh, if you have other women dentist role models out there, that could uh, write content for Dental Town Magazine or podcast. I mean, I, I look back at the 800 podcasts I've done, it's just mail, 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 if it's a dentist. And then if it's a woman, it's hygienist, consultant, marketing, SEO, you know. So thanks for being a woman role model, and thank you so much for coming on my show. My pleasure. And I actually have a, a, a definitely another female colleague of mine. She's an endodontist, and she's – She's really amazing. She, I'm sure she would love to be on your show. She uses lasers and ozone to, to treat root canal teeth, and she's getting great results. She uses stem cells and homeopathy. I think you really like talking with her. I would love to, and I hope both of you guys write articles because we need, we need more women role models. Um, and, and, and tell her that the first question I'm going to ask her is so many of the graduates walk out of school, half the class already has a self-limiting belief. They say, I hate endo. I hate endo. It's like, dude, you got $350,000 of student loans. You're in rural America. A patient's not going to you're in pain. I mean, imagine if you broke your arm and you went to the hospital and they said, uh, we don't do arms. Uh, <laughs> we, don't, we, we only do legs. Uh, we need to refer you. I mean, you're a doctor in your community. The person has a toothache. You don't have to sell them anything. So you got to get over I hate endo when you just grow, walked out of dental school an hour ago. So tell her how can how can she get these half the class to revisit Indo and maybe get over the hate thing and start uh, learning how to enjoy it again. Sounds good. I'll definitely pass on that message to her. Thank you very much, Howard. It's been awesome talking with you, and I'm looking forward to contributing to Dental Town and bringing you nutritional information. All right. On that note, I'm going to go eat some Doritos. Have a, rock <laughs> have a rocking hot day. Thank you, you too.